Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the fourth webinar in our six-part series on sexual harassment and assault in the workplace, brought to you by our working group comprised of members from the Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice, the Commission on Women in the Profession, the Commission on Domestic and Sexual Violence, and the Young Lawyers Division. My name is Paula Shapiro, and I'm the Associate Director of the Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. I encourage you to check out our section's website, www.americanbar.com.org slash CRSJ for news and information and replays of our fabulous first three programs in this series. During today's program, if you're so inclined, you can ask questions of our panelists by finding the questions box on the right-hand side panel and typing in your questions. You may also access a copy of the PowerPoint presentation by locating the handouts drop down and clicking there. Finally, we will be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who has registered so that you can share it widely with your network and it is free and open to the public. Please feel free to leave us feedback or ask a question in order to follow up. I will now turn it over to our moderator for today's panel, Stephanie Sharp. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we are delighted to have everyone joining us this morning. And we're looking forward to a meaty discussion about sexual harassment in the legal profession and what legal employers, our association, and lawyers can do to make things better. We're scheduled for one and a half hours, and um, we really, really like to hear from you in the course of that time with your questions at any time. If you submit a question, I'll be able to see it and hopefully I can bring it in and ask our commentators what their reaction is. So let me begin with short introductions. I'm Stephanie Sharp, Chair of the American Bar Association Commission on Women. I'm also a partner in Chicago with Sharp Banks Marmer, which is a large women-owned law firm. Um, I helped put together with Paulette here with us, Resolution 302, and I also am currently doing research on long-term careers for women in the law. What? Good, after, good morning. It's almost afternoon where I am. I'm Paulette Brown, and I'm very pleased to be here this morning to talk to you and with Stephanie and Greg. And I'm a past president of the American Bar Association and a partner in the Labor and Employment Group of Lock Lord. And I... My practice is pretty much limited to management side, employment matters, and um, um, just really happy to be here. So I'm, I'm well versed in the issues of self sexual harassment and discrimination. Greg. Hi, good morning. Uh, great to be here. Um, so I'm uh, a member of the labor and employment section of the ABA. Uh, I'm a partner of the firm Alton and Golden in New York and I represent employees exclusively uh, in a variety of matters, but uh, primarily discrimination matters and uh, a lot of sexual harassment matters. So I have a, a lot of experience in this area. Um, I'm also one of the co-editors of a recent publication by the ABA that's uh, kind of the genesis of this conversation today, Zero Tolerance, uh, Identifying and Combating Sex-Based Harassment in the Legal Profession. It's available now for anyone who's interested. <laughs> Uh, you know, essentially, it's it's uh, a reboot of a manual that the ABA put out uh, some time ago. I think the last version was about 10 years ago um, to give lawyers uh, sort of an understanding of sexual harassment uh, and primarily in, in the legal profession. Uh, and what we've done is, is sort of um, reboot it to add in, uh, to, to sort of modernize it, to sort of bring it up to speed with the Me Too movement. Um, and it, it sort of discusses, uh, you know, about some practical ways in which firms can deal with this issue. But I think it's also informative for lawyers in general uh, about the problem that's, that's, as we'll discuss, fairly prevalent in the legal profession. Thank you, Greg. And um, actually, that really does lead us to our very first question, kind of as a baseline. Let me ask each of you, starting with Paulette, what do we know about the state of sexual, about the, the extent of sexual harassment in the legal profession? 
Most of what we know is anecdotally, and I think that's primarily because, of, for the most part, um, women who are the usual victims of sexual harassment have been reticent about reporting sexual harassment, thinking that it would uh, deep six their legal careers because the legal community is so small. But we do know that sexual harassment in the legal profession does exist. Um, and that, um, uh, you know, there's been some movement, especially after the Me Too movement, of, of trying to address some of those issues. And women are a little more um, uh, or a, a little less hesitant about bringing um, sexual harassment issues to leaders in firms. But um, it is something that has traditionally, I believe, been underreported in the legal profession. Um, just because uh, sometimes people thought that it was an accepted way to conduct business and others believe that um, they would not be able to advance their careers if they complained about sexual harassment. So, so it is something that um, has existed in the legal profession and continues to exist in the legal profession as we've seen through some recent news stories. And, and Greg, before I, I turn to you to get your perspective, um, I want to emphasize what Paul had just mentioned, that most of our information is anecdotal. There have been a few local or regional surveys uh, by bar associations, um, which show the range is anywhere from 10% to over 50% of people reporting incidents of sexual harassment. And um, I also want to reemphasize Paul Ed's comment that sexual harassment, even in surveys like that, is typically underreported. There have been some independent studies of sexual harassment generally in other industries, and a minuscule percent, a very tiny percent, less than 5%, were found to be not so. So the, the phenomenon is both underreported and really does exist. But Greg, What's from your perspective? What what is the situation with sexual harassment in the legal profession? Well, certainly, I, I agree with both of you. Um, you know, spoiler alert: it's 2018, and there's still sexual harassment everywhere. Um, you know, there there have been uh, uh, Stephanie, you, you referred to some studies, and and it's a little um, hard to to put a thumb on what the numbers are. I've heard, you know, it, I think it is regional to some extent, uh, depending on where the studies are conducted. And I think there's a tremendous underreporting problem. And so it's very hard to get accurate data. You know, I've heard as low as 10% and as high as 70%. Um, and so it's, you know, it, it's hard to know. But I think, um, you know, some of the realities of uh, being a woman in the legal profession bear out what we're hearing anecdotally, which is that, uh, you know, something like 50% of law school graduates are women, but uh, I think currently it's somewhere around 28% uh, of partners are women, and it's an even smaller number. I think 18% are equity partners. Uh, and so I think one of the, the costs or one of the uh, ways in which sexual harassment bears out beyond just sort of the immediate effects uh, is that it causes a lot of women to leave the profession. And we're just not seeing uh, sort of the numbers of graduation sort of matching up percentage-wise with, with sort of more senior female roles within, within the practice. And it's even less so for, for, for women of color, too. Their numbers are not even close to the 18%. Absolutely. In fact, the numbers are 1.5%. They're extremely low. Right. So let me ask both of you from your perspectives, because you do have somewhat different practice perspectives. Um, is the issue of sexual harassment in the legal profession, does it have different causes or consequences than in other, I'm going to make a distinction here, than in other professions or other industries? Different causes or consequences. Uh, I think, Greg, I don't know whether you want to go first, um, but I think that um, lawyers have a higher ethical standard than in other professions. And, um, and that we are supposed to be the upholders of the law 
and be guided by a, prof a professional code of, code of responsibility. And I therefore think that uh, lawyers are and should be held to a higher standard to uh, give, give the public confidence in what it is that we're doing. So I think that, um, uh, you know, as with, I, I think that sexual harassment in any industry is not a good thing and that it's wrong. But I think that as it relates to lawyers and the legal profession, that we should, we should set a standard for the other professors because we are the upholders of the law. Greg? I agree wholly with Paulette, and, and that's where things like, uh, you know, Model Rule 8.4G come in, and we can talk about some of that later. I think we're planning to. Um, you right. know, in terms of, of how we see it within the legal profession, you know, I think um, just kind of taking a step back, uh, you know, sexual harassment is, is a species of gender discrimination. And so there's, uh, I think we have to think about the problem in sort of a, a larger context. Uh, but there's some things about being a lawyer that, uh, you know, I wouldn't say are, are unique to being a lawyer, but are, are sort of problems that lawyers face and other employees in other industries might not. Um, you know, there's there's definitely the uh, the power dynamic of the partner and the associate, and certainly those kinds of power dynamics exist in other industries. But the way in which uh, the legal profession is structured, particularly in kind of a, a traditional firm format, where uh, there's this trajectory ideally towards partnership, um, I think uh, that creates a host of problems that uh, you know aren't individual to the legal profession, but are worth discussing among legal professionals. Um, something we as a group had discussed yesterday, there's, uh, you know, I think with that, the issue of uh, rainmakers uh, and what to do with individuals that are primary business bringers to a firm that are engaging in this kind of behavior. Um, and you know, I, I think issues around around partnership. Uh, what you know, what does an associate who's in her ninth or tenth year do? It's, I think it's you know, there is mobility within the profession, but I think it's hard to move. I think it's hard for any any victim of sexual harassment to, to sort of have a plausible story going into another uh, you know another firm. But I think in the legal profession, it's it's just that much more difficult because there's this view that. If you don't make it after a certain amount of time, you're not going to make it, right? To become uh, sort of senior counsel or, or whatever the firm is, is choosing to designate that role. Okay, let me unpack some of that because that, yeah, that there's was a lot there. Content. And let me start with Paulette and ask her why do you think your perspective, and you represent a lot of employers, why do you Correct. think? sexual harassment takes place? Well, sometimes an environment is created where people may think that certain things are acceptable. And I think what's important is that you have a true leadership in this area, where you have a message that is driven from the top down uh, that says that sexual harassment will not be tolerated under any circumstance. I think that people have to understand what sexual harassment means. That, um, you know, that if you ask someone out twice and they say no, you don't ask them a third time. I think that some people think that flirting and um, other things, some people think that there's certain innocent behavior that they can engage in that does not rise to the level of sexual harassment. Harassment is just erroneous. So I think that a lot more education is necessary in this area so that people will understand all of the components that constitute sexual harassment. And um, and people still don't get the message that when someone says no, it means no. And, it, you know, but again, it's all driven from the top. No matter what organization you're in, whether you're in the law firm context or whether you're in any other context uh, of employment, um, there has to be constant education on what it means to sexually harass someone, um, that things are not innocent, um, that even when you think about uh, visual images and what you may have on your computer or what may be 
up on your computer when uh, someone of the opposite sex enters the room, all of those things can constitute sexual harassment and make someone feel extremely uncomfortable in the workplace. And that's what you want to avoid because when you have a victim of sexual harassment, then you're going to going to have a lot of other issues. That person is not going to feel um, very useful. Um, they they are going to uh, restrict themselves. They're going to impose limitations on themselves in terms of wanting to be a part of a team, wanting to provide contributions, and they can have a real detrimental effect on the organization. So, um, you know, sexual harassment is prevalent. I think that the more we do to have people to acknowledge that it's prevalent is a good first step. So let me pick up on that with you, Greg, because you represent um, plaintiffs. Um, where, where, what is the scope of behavior that constitutes sexual harassment? And, and in particular, are there gray areas? So if you're asking what is what is legally actionable versus what we should be concerned about as employers, legal employers, you know, I think the, the two are, are different. And um, just sort of tailing a little bit on what, what Paul said a moment ago, because it made me think of this, you know, I think in terms of effectively addressing the issue of harassment, um, there needs to be um, sort of a, a change in perception of what is the response of the firm once the issue is brought to their attention. And we can talk about what a, a thorough investigation entails and things like that. But I think uh, at, a, at a higher level, I think there's a psychology of rather than viewing it as problem solving, as, as issue resolution, it's thought of as liability management. And how do we prevent this from becoming a, a bigger legal issue for us? And I, that's not universal. And I was just thinking that, you know, uh, I'm, this is probably the most I've agreed with somebody in terms of what Paul Ed and, and you, Stephanie, are saying. Uh, I think we're, we're largely on the same page with this issue. Um, but I do think generally there's, there's a viewpoint within management that, uh, you know, the issue is about, um, you know, how do we prevent this from becoming an expensive problem as opposed to actually fixing the, the issue. Um, but to, to answer, the, I guess, the original question, Stephanie, you know, the, the view and, and um, you know, this is actually in the book, we advocate for this in the book, you know, the view of what sexual harassment in the workplace could be larger than what is legally actionable, because uh, the bottom line is where there's smoke, there's fire. And so there's a lot of behaviors uh, that may not rise to the level of severe and pervasive under federal law, or even, you know, if you have a gentler standard in, in whatever jurisdiction you're in. Fortunately, in New York, we have a fantastic uh, local law. Um, but, you know, the, the idea that things like bullying, things like, um, you know, on, on, a, on a small level, even in all, what, what might be considered an offhand comment, or if we're going to get into litigation, a, a stray remark, these are things that should be taken seriously, not because in and of themselves they're the biggest problem we're facing, but because they're indication of a larger problem. And so I think a broad definition of sexual harassment uh, from the view towards using that to prevent rather than to hold somebody specifically accountable is what's really useful. And I think also yeah, tying together some things that uh, you both mentioned earlier, women are leaving the legal profession. And even if, even if actions, even if conduct is not actionable as a technical legal matter, it certainly affects the well-being of, let's say, a law firm when the atmospherics are driving people away. So looking ahead, if you're a legal employer, you want to be included. And you want to make sure that you're not driving people away, even though it's not technically illegal what you're doing. Um, and I actually like to turn back to, to a concept that Paulette raised, and that is the concept of true leadership and what it means to have true leadership from the top. And let me give you an example. I know of several employers where 
the head of the firm or the head of the organization sent around a memo after you two, after uh, the Me Too movement kind of took hold and right. said, we don't tolerate sexual harassment. I'm not sure that's true leadership because it's a one-time memo and I don't know what the follow-up was. So I wanted to ask both of you, starting with Paulette, what is true leadership? in minimizing or eliminating sexual harassment? So true leadership is, um, to me, is, is one, it's sending out the memo, but there must be follow-up from the memo. There has to be active um, training, and I believe in um, live training um, on the subject as opposed to video training on the subject so that people will understand the importance that you have to take time from your day to understand and appreciate that we will not tolerate this. I think that um, that whoever is the leader of the organization should be present in some form, either live or by video if there are multiple offices, to say that this is something that we uh, want you to understand and acknowledge that this can happen in our workplace. I think that um, true leadership, um, th they will make such, um, informational educational series mandatory that it's not optional for people to participate in learning about what constitutes sexual harassment um, and i think that it's an ongoing process it's a message that has to be delivered repeatedly so that um, anybody new coming on board or people who may uh, quote unquote forget um, about it as time goes on that it's a continuous message that has to be delivered. And then the leader of the firm cannot always personally deliver the message. So they will let the people immediately under the under them help to deliver the message as well. But it has to be an ongoing process. And uh, people have to understand that the leader of the organization is involved. And the only way to do that is for the leader or leaders to make themselves very visible on the subject. So I'd like to ask both of you about training, because <clears throat> there have been some recent articles that training is not as effective as people think it is. Um, starting again with you, Paulette, since you represent employers, what's your view on what effective training is? And so, and so I don't think it's the issue of the training that's the problem. I think it's the issue of follow-up from the training or lack of follow-up, that's the issue. And people not really understanding, after I leave this session, what am I supposed to do now? And so I think that who was ever, you know, providing the education on the subject really, um, really should be also giving instructions to people as to what are next steps and what can they do um, so that they won't engage in bad behavior and what they can do if they see others engaging in bad behavior. So there has to be a mechanism for follow-up and for remedies um, um, to occur. So I, I don't think it's so much the training. I think it's the follow-up from the training that may be the missing piece. Greg? I mean, I would agree with Paulette insofar as, you know, I view training as, as the beginning and, and not the end. Um, you know, I, I think in 2018, especially if we're talking about lawyers, we're talking about the legal profession, everyone knows harassment is wrong. And uh, look, I think, you know, there's, there's we, we can sort of pick apart the psychology behind harassment and, and what, what a particular harasser understands or doesn't understand. But generally, my belief is that people know what they're doing at this at this point in time. What I think they don't understand is how wrong it is. And so I think in addition to education, you need accountability. Um, and that is, you know, a lot of, takes a lot of different forms. I think, you know, visibility of leadership is, is what Paulette was saying, and I agree with that. I think actual accountability, meaning there are real consequences for, for harassment. Um, and I think, you know, another important piece is accessibility, meaning, uh, you know, a message from the top saying, if you report harassment, you're not going to be retaliated against. 
and, and actually carrying through on that message. If the culture is it's okay to report this and we will take the investigation seriously and if there's harassment, we'll deal with it. And if there isn't, uh, in, in either event, you're not going to suffer any consequence. Um, you know, it, it's a little utopian, but I think it's the goal. I think it's what we're trying to accomplish. So I'd like to um, follow up with that in a minute, but we got our first question. And um, here it is. Um, I'm interested in how assistants, secretaries, paralegals are affected by sexual harassment in legal offices as well. And, and let me add on to the question, is it the same phenomenon for non-lawyer legal offices or is it Greg, you can go first with that. Yeah, Greg, why don't you just the last part again? I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, we're interested in how assistants, secretaries, paralegals are affected by sexual harassment in legal offices. And it is, is the phenomenon different for non-lawyers than it is for lawyers? I, I think that raises a really good point, which, uh, well, so let me ask the question, answer the question directly by, by saying it's, it's an issue for support staff as well, paralegal assistance. Um, and I feel like uh, generally that is, um, it's more difficult for those individuals to, to, to come forward because they're in a position of even less power. I think the power dynamic is even greater. <laughs> you know, you're dealing with uh, really the person that, that uh, is, is sort of above. It's the person they work for and it's, if we're talking about a partner and a paralegal, um, you know, that person is definitely afraid they're going to lose their job if they say something. It's their word against the harassers. Um, and what credibility do they have? They were hired a year ago, you know. Um, but I think uh, it, it raises something I meant to, to mention earlier in terms of thinking about sexual harassment more broadly. You know, we're talking about the context of, of a law firm and lawyers, but definitely keeping in mind that there's this issue extends beyond um, you know, just lawyers and beyond just the workplace. Um, and, you know, there's anecdotal uh, uh, stories about, you know, places in this country where you go into court and the judge still calls you honey. I mean, th there's things like that that are still prevalent. And, and that's all part of, I think, the concern we want to address here. All right. I, I, I totally agree. When, when, you, when you start talking about um, people who are not lawyers, their, their power or, or their sense of what they are able to do is even far less than the actual attorney, which is, again, why it's so important to have leadership from the top and to have everyone to understand that they have the right and the ability to make a complaint. Um, it, it is... It is, it is um, uh, you know, sometimes people will think that because they are not a lawyer, that they don't have the same type of rights that lawyers have, that they are not able to um, access um, the system or the processes for complaints that others have. And you have just a host of other dynamics that come into play when you're talking about the non-lawyer population and you know for the most part a lot of these people are female many of them are heads of their households and it is going to be so much more likely that they are not going to report any form of sexual harassment which makes them in a sense much easier prey um and 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 easier to be victimized um um uh, from from sexual harassment, so it is it is again where leadership is really critical, and having everyone to understand that um, whatever policies are in place with regard to um, uh, anti harassment, um, that it applies to everyone. So both of you have mentioned in different responses the concept of power. And let me ask you something very specific because you may have had the experience where uh, one of the most powerful people in a firm was uh, accused of sexual harassment. Let's say one of the top 10 rainmakers in the firm. How should law firms respond to that situation? 
or and I, I guess I'm going to ask the question a little differently. How, what responses have you seen law firms take when a very powerful member of the firm is accused of sexual harassment? And what was good or not so good about those responses? What would you recommend an ideal response when a very powerful member of the firm is accused of sexual harassment? Do you want me to answer first? Sure, Greg, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I think the answer is, you know, whether they're, they're the least productive attorney or the most productive attorney with all the client relationships, they should be treated the same way. And so if it's serious harassment, the fact that they also bring a lot of money to the firm shouldn't be a consideration. I, I tend to uh you know i tend to take kind of a harsh line and I, I i understand the other side of the picture in terms of um you know uh, a firm needs to maintain business and things along those lines but i mean i think you know i advocate for a strong response but whatever the response is i think the fact that someone is bringing in a lot of money shouldn't influence whether or not the firm does the right thing um you know part of the question was what have you seen um you know there's there was that case a few years ago in New York um, with a, an associate and and uh, basically the situation, a Rainmaker partner was the Faruqi and Faruqi uh, against Alexandra Marchuk. You know, she uh, essentially was raped by this partner um, and the firm backed, backed this partner through trial uh, and it ended up being uh, really a smear campaign on this plaintiff, and she won, but she she didn't win a tremendous amount. And the firm saw that as a victory, and I think that's the exact wrong message that should be sent. That you know, uh, if if you complain and you want to proceed with your case, we'll beat you down, we'll smear your name, and we'll make it so you wish you never said anything. I think that's the complete wrong response. So, uh, so I, I, you know, you know, thinking, thinking about that, and also thinking about something that you said earlier, Greg, is about uh, whether the the firm should consider the liability that they face and the value of reputation and dollars if they allow someone, even if they are a big rainmaker, to um, to to go undisciplined. Um, I can think of a, a good example of, of when a firm took action and 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 I and it, and it happened at a holiday um, party where and a, a partner was engaged in completely uh, inappropriate behavior towards a um, a female associate and by the following morning was terminated and so um, I think that that is the correct response and it wasn't as a result of a lack of investigation because there were eyewitnesses and and it was almost to the point where the partner acknowledged the the bad behavior so i think that when those things happen um you know and and i have to say that that happened at my firm um in in one of our other offices and i think that that was the absolute appropriate response and i think that um you know it it, it was it was the right thing to do at the time, and I think that it sends a really strong message that we are not going to tolerate this type of behavior. And so I agree with you, Greg, that um, it doesn't matter what the status of the person is in the organization, because in the long run, even going beyond it being the right thing to do to address it, um, it can have um, a lot of collateral consequences if it's not appropriately addressed. So let me turn to a little bit of a broader context. A few months ago, every day you picked up the newspaper, you were reading about Me Too. And that's kind of lapsed, at least from the front pages. What what impact do you think um, the Me Too, I'm reluctant to call it movement because I'm not sure that's so, but what impact do you think Me Too has had on the legal profession? And do you think it will have led for a long time to come? Paula? I, I, I personally think that um, it has had pretty much minimal effect 
on the legal profession. Um, I, you know, with many other industries, you have seen people come forth um, in great numbers, and I just have not seen that in the legal profession. And I think that it's not necessarily because sexual harassment does not exist in the legal profession, because I believe it does, but it may not happen as much anymore because lawyers understand the ethical considerations that come along with it. But I also think it's as a result of um, the legal profession is still a very closed community and people are still concerned about uh, things that happened in the case that was referenced by Greg, that their reputation will be smeared, that they won't be able to find another legal position anywhere in the country. Um, and so I think that people in the legal profession are still a little reticent about reporting sexual harassment. Greg, what's yeah, your... I, I mean, in terms of, of the legal profession, I don't know that I've seen uh, an, an uptick. I mean, I, I definitely have been receiving more calls generally, uh, and I've been talking to more individuals, and I think, um, you know, the movement has empowered women in a general sense to feel like they can at least pick up the phone and, and talk to a lawyer. Um, there are a lot of calls about what is this harassment. And so I think people are just more uh, more comfortable having a dialogue. Does, does it mean more sexual harassment is coming out? Uh, maybe. One thing I would say about the legal profession is that, um, you know, there are, I think there's a, an increased awareness and increased willingness to talk about it if, if not take legal action. And what I mean by that is there are uh, like a host of anonymous uh, like blogs and things like that where people can talk about their story. And I don't, I don't know that attorneys are, are comfortable attributing identity to those stories just yet, but I think there's a conversation kind of going on in, uh, in the social networking space about this that, that is maybe a forerunner to uh, sort of a, a greater, you know, a movement without anonymity. So, um, kind of along the same lines. They're, they're going to, they're going to the websites like Blind. Yeah, I think so. the names are, are sort of a few, but there are these, there are a lot of websites in a lot of different industries right. where, where people are uh, sort of recounting their experience uh, without attribution, but it's still, right. you know, and, and there's actually, there are groups that are, you know, trying to kind of connect the dots on some of these and, and sort of help help people feel like they're not alone. I mean, that, that's a big part of the Me Too movement is, right. you know, this isn't just happening to me, it's happening to my colleague down the hall. Uh, and I right. think that sort of, uh, you know, comfort knowing that you're not alone, I think is, is what's helping a lot of women come forward. Right. And, and the other the other kinds of other kinds of websites that allow people to talk about it and say things without being identified by their employers. Right. So before I ask my next question, let me encourage everybody listening. We got a wonderful first question to continue to send questions to us. We'd love to hear from you. And let me turn to um, a little bit of a question, but it's about the Zero Tolerance book that the commission just published. Greg was an editor. And not so much about the book, but about the concept of zero tolerance. What What is that concept, and why is it a positive way of thinking about the issue of sexual harassment? And, and Greg, let me begin with you on that. So zero tolerance says I mean, I think it, it means exactly that, right? That we're not going to tolerate sexual harassment, but I think more than that, we're not going to tolerate an environment that that permits it. Uh, and so I think the focus is, uh, you know, I think that the concern some have, and, and Paulette may speak on this, but the concern some have is zero tolerance means uh, shoot first and ask questions later. Uh, and I think that's not what I'm advocating. I don't think that's what the book is advocating. I think the idea is, you know, there's a lot of ways to address the issue and there's a, a, a lot of levels of involvement. And I think the, the main goal is acknowledging that there is a problem. And I think that's something firms may not even be, be doing at this point is even acknowledging. And two, you know, taking 
their steps, whether it be through uh, prevention, whether it be through investigation, whether it be through education, uh, to eliminate it, um, you know, it doesn't mean that if somebody is accused of harassment, uh, you know, we hang them by their toes and kind of figure out what happened later. But it does mean if you're going to do an investigation, you do it thoroughly, you do it appropriately, you talk to uh, the right people and, and not sort of do a one-sided. I mean, my, my big concern about in investigations, uh, and Paula, maybe you can speak to this, is you know, the, the issue I brought up earlier that when an investigation is done, is the investigation done to find out what's really happening or is it being done so that the company can prepare itself for some future litigation or to protect itself if, if, you know, if something goes forward. And I think that there isn't a universal answer to that question. I think, you know, some, some firms do it one way and some do it another. Maybe the goal is to have everybody doing it the same way. So um, what I'm about to say may be a little bit controversial. Um, and, and I do believe that sexual harassment definitely exists. But I think that there are also degrees of or, or levels of different complaints. So, you know, I've seen situations where people have accused someone of sexual harassment because they said, oh, you look very nice today, or that's a lovely dress you're wearing today. And I think that, you know, a person who asks somebody out on um, a date um, is, is very different than someone who sexually assaults someone or who otherwise physically assaults someone. So I think that whereas, you know, there can be zero tolerance um, with regard to sexual harassment, I think that we still have to look at it very, very carefully and find out whether it requires progressive discipline or whether it requires some other type of immediate action. I think that, um, you know, sometimes, and, and I can't speak as to what types of investigations companies have done, but I'm not so sure that, or I think that we have to be very careful and making sure that we do conduct a thorough investigation of what exactly happened. Um, and I don't know whether you can differentiate between investigating what exactly happened um, from preparing for any losses because that that's not the you can't help but have that in the back of your mind when someone has actually filed a complaint that they may be inclined to file a lawsuit. So you do want to get at the truth. You want to get it uh, at what exactly what happened. Um, but, you know, you want to make an assessment as to uh, the type of redress that's going to occur based on the particular circumstances. Let me ask you about investigations, because um, there had been news reports lately about how even some large organizations on Facebook issues of sexual harassment have conducted their own investigations. And of course, we know as lawyers that lawyers are often hired to conduct investigations of sexual harassment or discrimination. Do you have a view on the circumstances when it's appropriate to do an in-house investigation or when it's appropriate not to do an in-house investigation? No, you always, when, when once a complaint is filed, I believe you have an obligation to do an investigation. And I don't think that um, it's, when you have a complaint of sexual harassment, an investigation must follow. Um, I, I don't think that it's that it's optional um, as to whether you do an investigation or whether it's not up to the employer or anyone to decide that the complaint is minuscule or or that it's not worthy of pursuing. Only an investigation will be able to tell you that. And, and Greg, in your experience, is there a difference between investigations done in house? versus investigations done by outside firms. Sorry, I have a motion. There we go. <laughs> if I'm not moving at my desk, the lights go off. Um, so, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, it's an option 
that uh, you know firms should consider, uh, meaning having an outside investigator. I agree with Paulette that you know there should be some level of internal investigation, but I think recognizing when you know, for example, uh, you know, the in a small firm situation or uh, a situation where there it's you know at least from, even if from a, an appearance standpoint. Uh, there may be parties involved in the investigation that, uh, you know, have some relationship with a harasser or something like that to, to sort of create at least the appearance of neutrality in that investigation, I think is helpful. I, I think it's a case-by-case -case situation. I think it depends on who we're talking about and, and what the allegations are. But I think it's, it's something that uh, probably makes more sense to do than, than is practiced currently. So let me turn to a slightly different topic. We've been talking about law firms, and um, sometimes we get misled by American lawyer into thinking most of the world works in big law firms. But the statistics are that something like 85% of all lawyers work in small legal settings. Do you think uh, that there are different concerns or different experiences or different reactions in small firms versus putting aside the mega firms that really don't employ most lawyers in America? Is it different in smaller firms? I think so. Um, you know, in a large firm, you have a lot of resources and you have a lot of structure, and at least in theory, you're, you're better equipped to deal with some of these issues. Uh, you know, in a small practice of three, four attorneys, um, you know, the, the practical reality, so, you know, we're talking about the rainmaker problem, well, that, that's one quarter, even if that person is, is just doing their even share of work, that's a big piece of the business. Um, and I think there's, there's just less accountability when you have a smaller practice. Um, you know, some of the worst stories of harassment I've heard have been in, in small office situations. And I think there's just, uh, there's less uh, oversight, there's less training, there isn't necessarily an HR department, they're doing it themselves in-house. Um, and it's, it's sort of like a startup situation where they're flying by the seat of their pants. Uh, and so, you know, things like formalities, things like protection, things like anti-retaliation, they just don't exist. Um, so I think it is, it's a bigger problem in, in a smaller, a smaller practice. All right. I, 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 I tend to agree with that. Um, and I think that, um, you know, the victim is also going to be less likely to come forward because one, who do they complain to? And two, um, you know, where, where will they go? You know? And so, they will have to not complain in order to, to, to stay in their current position. And I think that an additional um, element comes into play, too, when you're in a small environment that, unfortunately, it can also come from clients um, who believe that they can engage in this type of conduct. And because you're in a small operation, um, you're less likely to complain about it, too, because um, you know, it's, it's where your, your bread and butter is coming from, and, and what do you do? Where do you go? Um, and, and I've seen that, unfortunately, happen, you know, as it relates to clients. And the people who are above you in the firm, they won't make waves about it because it's the source of their business and their livelihood and what keeps the firm going. Let me turn to some questions that have sort of become front burner in the news lately. And one of them is the use of mandatory arbitration agreements. And by that I mean an agreement when you join an employer that you agree to waive any rights you might have to file a lawsuit in court about sexual harassment. And instead you agree that if you have any such claim, you will bring it to private arbitration. What are your views about that? I'm going to start with Greg. So, I, I mean, my, my view is, I mean, and particularly, you know, we're talking generally here about at-will employment. There, there are some uh, 
some attorneys who have contracts, but generally speaking, it's an at-will employment situation. Anytime you're being asked to give up rights as a condition of simply being employed, I don't have an issue with that. Um, you know, in the context of, of arbitration specifically, you know, it's something that the parties can always agree to. You know, there are confidentiality concerns that the plaintiff may have, uh, and maybe arbitration makes sense. Uh, but generally, you know, she's entitled to her day in court, uh, and m my view is that she shouldn't be waiving that right, um, you know, prospectively without really knowing what she's waiving. You know, it, it's a different thing to ask her to waive it at the time she would be coming forward with a claim, but, you know, prospectively at the time of employment, uh, I'm, I'm not comfortable with that. My own experience with arbitration also is that, you know, it's not... Uh, the best forum for sexual harassment claims. Um, I've been told by management attorneys that I should think differently about that and that things have changed. Um, and, and that may be the case, and maybe that's not the focal consideration here, but it's also not the forum I would want to be in uh, if it was going to litigation. Well, what's your view? So, so as someone who represents employees, my, my take on it is, is somewhat different. Um, I don't think that um, everyone who enters into an agreement is um, someone who has a lack of understanding about what they're getting into. I think that um, um, that you know consideration can be in the form of employment, especially if you are a highly compensated employee. Um, I think that arbitration can be appropriate under some some circumstances, and I think that especially uh, when it comes later on. Um, um, in in the process that uh, many times plaintiffs don't want um, information to be revealed. They don't want to be exposed um, to to the public and to what they have agreed to. I know that there is current legislation pending in a number of different states with regard to not having confidential settlement agreements. Um, and not having, you know, the arbitration agreements that, that you talked about. And there's been, my experience is that there's been a real split um, between plaintiff's bar um, and, and defense bar, uh, plaintiff's bar in particular, because there are many plaintiff's attorneys who believe that, um, that their clients are, are in a better position when things are not made public. And many of their clients don't want such issues to be made public. So um, I don't I don't know that we can, uh, or I would say personally that um, as as a general rule that there should not be arbitration agreements or there should not be confidentiality agreements concerning settlements in sexual harassment cases. Let me it can work to the advantage of both sides. Yes. Can I just follow up? I mean, my, I I understand that that point, and I I mean it's an issue that. I deal with a lot. I have clients that definitely do not want uh, the, the reputational harm that might come with uh, publicizing their experience. Um, and I have others that do. I have, I have clients that come in and, and are, say, can we go, you know, can we go to the press? Can we, you know, I, I won't put on a sandwich board and march down Fifth Avenue. But, but I guess my point is it should be the client's decision and not the employer's decision that confidentiality makes sense in some situations, that arbitration would make sense in some situations, doesn't to me create a rule that it should be what happens in all situations. And, well, and these arbitration everything. provisions are generally applied across the board, right? And there, there's no individualized conversation with the employee. Generally, it's, it's a condition of employment. But but I think that in most instances or in, in the most of the instances that I've seen where there are arbitration agreements, they also um they're not um for for people who who, who don't have my experience, who don't have um a level, a high level of understanding of what that means. So let me let me ask you about another aspect of arbitration that came up in a recent discussion we were having in the commission. Uh, with our liaisons, and the idea that something like 15% of arbitrators are women, and that the vast majority of arbitrators that you can select from are men. 
So here's my question. Does it make a difference whether an arbitrator or a judge, does it make a difference whether the person overseeing the case, deciding the case, or the panel in arbitration deciding the case, does it matter whether they're male or female? I think that any panel should have a diversity of representation to offer different perspectives. Um, if you have a panel that is only comprised of men, for example, they may not have a, an appreciation of all of the circumstances or may do things not as seriously as someone who may have actually experienced something. And, you know, you know, the subject that you raise is also one that is really on the radar of the astute, the suit resolution committee of the ABA because the women in ABR are putting forth a resolution, I believe, in the summer that's similar to Resolution 113 that's asking that there be more diversity in the selection of arbitrators and those who get to be arbitrators. And I, and I think that it's primarily for that reason so that you can have different perspectives. Uh, people don't think the same way. They come from different cultures, different avenues, and their experiences are, are totally different. And so it's like with anything else, that if you have a homogenous group of people, they're not going to be able to, no matter how smart they are, they're not going to be able to uh, maybe get everything because they have not had the same type of experience. So I think, I think diversity is extremely important. Greg, I know that you've been in a number of arbitrations over sex discrimination or sexual harassment. What has been your experience with the panels and what, whether composition matters? So I, I think I tend to agree with Paulette in that it's my concern is less about whether the arbitrators are uh, male or female. And, and there's a... I think there's a very interesting and complicated psychology that goes into how how people are in a position to be, uh, you know, finders of fact on a case like this. Think about these issues, um, but I, I think you know to say more generally, I don't know that having an all female panel is necessarily going to be better than than an all male panel. I, I think the concern from from the standpoint is, you know. Uh, for a long time, and, and I'm told by my colleagues on the other side, people at Epstein Becker and elsewhere, that this is changing and there is greater diversity, but there really isn't, hasn't been for a long time a diversity of, uh, you know, not just cultural diversity, but a diversity of opinion in terms of who is an arbitrator. And I think the perception that, um, you know, to, to no offense to anyone who, who's on this webinar, but it's just, you know, it's sort of old white men, um, is, is true, but the issue isn't that they're old white men so much as they have a set of values that's not consistent with uh, current values. Um, and I think, you know, having having a, a diversity within your panel, um, you know, potentially, and so I've heard that actually a lot from, from management side that, look, if you had a more diverse panel, you would be more interested in arbitration. I think there's just a little hesitation to to try that, um, you know, but I, I don't know. It's, I, it's something I don't have enough experience to say, um, you know, that the arbitration would be better. My own experience is that I'm, I'm not in favor of arbitration, but, uh, you know, I think there's a theoretical model where arbitration might be less uh, undesirable than it currently is from, from my side of the picture. Okay. So and to me, any anytime you have diversity of thought or whatever, you're going to get a better result. So, um, I, I I received a couple more questions, but I want to save them for the moment, and I want to turn to ABA Resolution 302, and this was a resolution sponsored by the Commission on Women and other groups of the ABA. Um, spearheaded extremely helpfully by um, Paulette Brown here on the call, President Hillary Bass, and other top leaders of the ABA, and passed as an official policy of the American Bar Association February 2018. There um, is a 
part of the resolution on your screen, but its purpose was to adopt um, specific policies and procedures that for law firms and other employers to adopt uh, policies and procedures that prohibit, prevent, and promptly redress harassment and retaliation based on sex, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, and the intersectionality of sex with race and or ethnicity. And there are nine um, specific components to the resolution, nine specific policies and procedures um, that encompass it. I'm not sure that it is on your screen, um, but I would like to ask both Olette and Greg, are there any particular policies and procedures in Resolution 302 that you think will be especially impactful if they're adopted by employers? Right. So there's there's kind of two that I uh, think are, are, I mean, they're all important, uh, but I think for the purpose of having a discussion, um, number six is, is maybe in my mind the most important, uh, which is prohibition of retaliation against the complainant and her witnesses. Um, and the other one, number seven, uh, is implementation of corrective actions as appropriate including but not limited to termination to enforce the policy against harassment and retaliation. Um, and so the latter gets to accountability, which is something I talked about earlier. The reason I think anti-retaliation is so important is that I think there really are a lot of women who have not come forward to, to talk about their experience. I think it's, it's hidden in, in, a, in a large respect. And I think if there was complete comfort in, 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 in the ability to talk about this issue, we'd all be shocked at what we hear. Um, and so I think anything that encourages those women to come forward and talk about what their experience is, not only addresses the issue, but helps us understand the scope of the problem in a way that I think will have reciprocal effect. Meaning if more women are coming forward, I think more people are going to take it seriously. I think it, it can sort of create a cycle of, of addressing this issue. Um, but I, I've just spoken to so many women that are just so reluctant to, to talk about their experience in all industries. Um, and, and just the fear of what is going to happen to them either through their job or how they're going to be painted or you know being not being believed. There are so many issues that, that go into I guess the comfort level of coming forward. And so I think that to me is, is the most important piece of that. Let me ask you a follow up, Paula, before you comment. This is a resolution, and it, one of its components is prohibition of retaliation against the complainant and her witness, which you just commented on. Why do you think that is currently the law, as I understand? Retaliation is, is not. Right. Why, what do you think is the difference between having a law like that and having a resolution like that? And, and Paul, um, you so, have a position to answer that. I don't mean to put Greg on the spot. Oh, did you, you want, want Greg to answer, answer that? To talk. Go ahead, Paula. Oh, I thought you wanted Greg to answer that. So, so I think that, you know, there are laws against retaliation, even if you can't substantiate the underlying claim of discrimination, you can still be found liable for retaliation. But I think that sometimes, you know, with regard to the resolution, sometimes things don't rise to the level of something that is legally actionable or that will withstand a summary judgment motion, for example. And so in the in the law firm context in the regular employer employer context the resolution and the provisions in the resolution are really important because it goes to a different level um that just because it's not legally actionable does not mean that you should still do it and so that's why the resolution is really important in that regard yeah i think Go ahead, i was just gonna say i mean i think there's you know and this is 
pretty much exactly what Paul said, but I think there's like a retaliation with a capital R and retaliation with a lowercase mm -hmm. r, right? And so mm -hmm. there's there's what is legally actionable, but you know, I think everybody understands that um, if you make a complaint, you may be in a situation where it's hard to say yes, this is retaliation. Did did uh, my colleague get put on that case instead of instead of me? You know, because I complained or because uh, you know because that person really is more qualified. There's all of these little things that can add up over time. You know, was the decision not to make me partner this year because I complained three years ago, or is it, you know, they, there really is some deficiency in, in my work or my client base. So I, I think that that issue, I, you know, I think it is illegal to retaliate, but I think the practical reality is it can be very difficult to prove. And I think that's why it's such a discouragement. Right. So so it's like the micro messaging and the micro inequities that happen on a regular basis that generally you only the victim of the micro inequities or microaggressions know that they're actually happen and happening because they can be so subtle that people around them can't see them or don't know that they're really occurring. Um, but 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 the victim can definitely feel the impact. So that's why it's important. And and, you know, I. I, if I can go back to the resolution, I think that six and seven are obviously extremely important, but I really look at number nine as well, because I think that um, we Larry, have to look up. Tell us what it is. Me? Tell okay, us what num okay, number nine is the development of initiatives that foster training and other innovative programs to address the problem of harassment. So I think that, you know, we want to look upstream and um, find out the roots of these issues and address them so that they won't occur in the first instance. And so I don't think that we can't work on six and seven, but I think that we really need to focus a lot on number nine so that we will see less and less and less of these issues. So I'm glad you mentioned that, Paulette, because one of the questions we got is is the following, and it's about training. Do the panelists think that if more training on how to be a rainmaker were given to every lawyer in the firm, there would be less pressure to permit sexual harassment by a major rainmaker to slide? And, and I think that the, the context of the question is when firms have a limited number of rainmakers, and most today by surveys, because I, I know I've done many surveys, are men, when there are only a limited number of rainmakers, what if you were to broaden, broaden the base for rainmaking by training in different aspects of developing rainmakers? Would that have an impact on? on sexual harassment really um, I, I personally think that um, when you spread out um, who gets credit for bringing in work and who can potentially be the the rainmakers I think that that will make a difference because more people will have power in the organization um, I think that resolution 113 is probably going to help with that because clients are I'm insisting that more women get credit for um, for work that's being brought into the firm, and the more women get credit for work that's being brought into the firm, the more power they will they will have, and um, and 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 the rainmaking will be sort of spread out. Also, I think that um, it 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 will start to make a difference, although in not so much immediate, is that um, they're not as many quote-unquote institutional clients as they used to be throughout firms um, and again with a lot of the general counsels really concerned about more women getting credit for the work that's generated in the firm I think that over time we are going to see some 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 changes and some differences in the dynamic of sexual harassment but I also, you know, we've been talking a lot about uh, women being sexually harassed. I think that, you know, you know, it can it can work both ways. Women aren't the only ones who are sexually harassed, um, and it's and it's and it's men, it's members of LGBT groups, it's transgender people. You know, anybody can be sexually harassed, um, and generally, it's 
though those of who are harassed are those who are perceived to have less power. You know, um, uh, it's, it's generally people who have power over someone who is more likely to commit the sexual harassment. So, um, you know, having people with more power, which sometimes, especially in the law firm context, translates into dollars, I think will make, make a difference. So let me turn to another ABA initiative. It's resolution 8.4. It, G. Uh, G is in George, right? And um, it was passed by the House of Delegates in the summer of 2016. And I hope Paula does not mind me saying that she is absolutely the major reason that this got passed and accepted by the ABA. And um, I, I think that we should begin by just asking Paula your general view of the need for uh, resolution 8.4G. And then I'm going to turn to both of you and ask how has this affected uh, the legal profession? But Paula, tell us why this was needed. So 8.4G was adopted because, um, you know, most of the, the entities in the ABA continue to express concern that discrimination continued to exist in the legal profession and that despite best efforts to do things voluntarily, that things just weren't happening to alleviate discrimination in the legal profession. And also to have an understanding of what it means to discriminate and within what confines um, discrimination can occur. So. You know, it has anything to do with while engaged in the practice of law. Um, and while engaged in the practice of law can mean that you are at a client meeting or that you have a softball team um, that's participating in a league um, that uh, constitutes engagement in the in the practice of law. And, you know, basically um, it is a method, a mechanism by which, you know, ethics you can be um, in violation of the code of ethics if you discriminate against someone. It would seem that it would be a no-brainer. It's like, how could that not already be um, uh, an ethics rule? But there are many people who had some concerns about limitations on freedom of speech and just an overall abridgment of their rights, which it's not um, intended to do at all is just to make a, an environment um, that is discrimination free in the legal profession and like with other ethical violations of the code of ethics that this will be one of them. The judges have had it for many years and so it's right that it should apply to lawyers as well. Greg, what has been, um, what experiences have you had or reactions to 8.4G? So where I practice in my jurisdiction, which is New York, uh, there's been a, a form of 8.4G in, in our ethics rules for some time. Um, it's actually a, uh, I'll say a less good version of this because there's uh, an exhaustion requirement, which, which you know the ABA didn't include uh, with 8.4G. Um, so in terms of practical effects, um, you know, I, I don't know that it's changed all that much for New York, but I, I do think it's it's just a very important uh, moment for you know the largest bar association in the country to to because th there are a lot of states that don't have any uh, professional conduct rule like this, um, and to send the message that um, and I think this is what what Paul had actually started with today that lawyers uh, should be held to a, a higher standard. I think that's appropriate. I think. Um, you know, there's a legal standard, but there's also an ethical standard, and I think that's part and parcel with who we are and what we do. Um, and I, I don't think we get to say the rules don't apply to us. I think we, we need to be role models, uh, and being held to a higher standard is, is the way to do that. So, I, you know, I, I don't know practically, you know, I don't know of other states that have enacted a similar rule since uh, 8.4G came out in, in 2016, but, um, you know, I, I do think it's a positive for the profession. So let me ask you this about 8.4G. Um, it says it, it's professional misconduct for a lawyer to 
engage in conduct that the lawyer knows or reasonably should know is harassment or discrimination. Um, I'm interested in, at, at a kind of more fact level, examples of how a lawyer reasonably should know that conduct is harassment or discrimination and whether there has, have been issues about that. So I know that there was a lot of debate around this language and, and both of you are probably familiar with that. Um, and, you know, my partner, Wendy Lazar, was, was involved in, in that. Um, so, you know, I, my, my viewpoint and I think the reason, you know, people were advocating for a higher standard eventually uh, decided they could live with this language is, you know, it does uh, create sort of a, a knowledge or an intent requirement. And I think there was a lot of concern that uh, 8.4G would be, uh, without an intent requirement, really would raise some of the concerns that Paula was, was mentioning, either about either being un unfairly applied or a, an abridgment of speech or something like that. Um, you know, the flip side of that is, um, you know, intent in a sexual harassment case generally can be inferred by the conduct. And so I don't know that uh, if, we're, if for the specific discussion around sexual harassment, that language is as critical as it is in, in other contexts where, uh, you know, there, there may be sort of some discussion around pretext or something like that. Um, but, but that's my two cents. But, but Paul, you might be in a better position to talk about that. Well, there, there, there have been some states that have been really proactive who are really adamantly opposed to 8.4G. And in fact, um, uh, the Attorney General in Texas threatened the Bar Association that if they adopted 8.4G, that it would basically strip the bar of its authority. Uh, Montana legislature also got involved and just said, it will not happen in Montana. Um, and, you know, it's to me, you know, it's, you know, so you have both sides of the, of the coin. I, I have to tell you that based on the history of discrimination, um, with, as it relates to all the groups that are covered, um, it didn't occur to me that there would be really so much controversy surrounding it, but there has been quite a bit. There are people who are seriously opposed to it. A lot of religious um, concerns have been raised um, concerning it, um, and, um, and 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 also from you know groups like um, the Federalist Society and, and things like that. Although all of them are not opposed to it, but you know just um, you know it's been it's been very interesting to watch to see how people actually interpret 8.4G, um, believing that. Um, that that there will be more complaints filed, that there will be a burden on the system, that people will file complaints really nilly. But so far, that has not happened. There's been no uptick in um, complaints, um, to my knowledge, concerning you know as it relates to claims of discrimination um, under 8.4G. And there and there are a number of safeguards. Um, that are in a number of other provisions of provisions of the uh, model rules of professional conduct. And my theory is just don't discriminate. You won't have to worry about it. Great. So we're about to wind down. Um, we have a question that I'd like to ask both of you. And here it is. I'm just one person. What can I do? to help improve the situation, to help eliminate sexual harassment in the legal profession. Greg, do you want to go first? Sure. So if you're one person um, who is experiencing harassment, um, I think the, the, the answer is, is figuring out how to how to speak up in some manner that you're comfortable with, whether that's within the organization or without, uh, whether it's anonymous or you know not anonymous. I think as someone who is just trying to advance the movement, um, it's you know uh, I hate to borrow from uh, the, the New York 
city transit authority, but if you see something, say something, right? It's sort of, um, it, it exists, harassment exists because there are people who are harassing, but there's, it also exists because it's tolerated. Um, and so to the extent you are aware of a situation, um, not being passive in that situation, uh, whatever that means, uh, it, is, is what I would say. That, that's what I would suggest. So, so, right. So when you're thinking about what one person can do, um, you can basically empower someone else to come forward. Um, that you can, you can, when you see it, you, especially if you have any modicum of power, you can call it out. Um, you can pull the, 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 the person who is committing the discrimination, you can pull them aside and, and ask them, do you realize what it is that you're doing? You can make the person, because sometimes the victims are rendered invisible in these types of circumstances. And so you can help that person become visible in helping them to bring forth their personal complaint. And you can also, as an individual, um, uh, educate people on, um, on what, it, what exactly it means to um, be a victim of harassment and what exactly it means to be a harasser. Because sometimes people think that little things that they may do don't rise to the level of harassment, and so they need to be educated. And sometimes it takes um, a person who they are familiar with, who they are friends with, um, to really explain that to them so that they can have an appreciation for it and be more receptive to it. And let me add... Oh, can I just add one thing, which is that it's, I think, generally known, but not as known as, as some of the other protections under law, if you raise a complaint on behalf of someone else or you participate as a witness uh, on someone else's behalf in a discrimination case, you're equally protected under the law from retaliation, even though it's not your complaint. And so that's something that I don't know if everyone is aware of, but they should be aware of as well. And let me add another suggestion. There is power in numbers. I really urge anyone who's interested in this topic to not just join the American Bar Association, but reach out to me or Paulette or Greg. We would be happy to get you involved in a project or an initiative. We'd be happy to help you put on a CLE to you, for you to network with people with like interests. Uh, I really believe that one of the huge advantages of being in a bar association is not do you it's not simply that you learn more, but you can do more on a very much broader platform. So with that. Can, can I just make one more point? Um, yeah. I think that it's real important for each individual to know and understand the policy that's in place because almost every employer has a policy relating to anti-sexual harassment and discrimination. And I think that it's really important for each person to have a full understanding of the policies that exist within their organization and the reporting process. And in some instances, to further Greg's point, is, is some policies say that if you see something and don't report it, then you have an additional responsibility or liability as well. So I think that it's important for everyone to know and understand the policies that exist within their own organization. That's a very good point. And um, I think we've come to the end of our road here. I would like to again thank Paulette Brown, Greg Chiarello. Wonderful, wonderful comments. We're putting in a plug a for you. Be sure to buy this wonderful hotline. <laughs> Zero Tolerance, Best Practices for Combating Sexual Harassment in the Legal Profession. Uh, thank you again. I know that we're kind of in a webinar, so we can't all clap hands, but I'm clapping my hands, and thank you again very much. And the toolkit, the Zero Tolerance Toolkit that's coming out from the commission, Stephanie. Yes, absolutely. Um, we have lots of toolkits. We have a toolkit on grit, which we've rolled out. We have a toolkit on bias interrupters, which we're rolling out. We have a toolkit on zero tolerance. All of the, all of those 
are not just good resources individually, but again, I invite you to be one of those people who is sponsoring and putting out a program on these topics because spreading the word is really important and knowing that lots of people feel strongly about sexual harassment and that it should not exist in the legal profession is also really important. So again, thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Paul. Yeah, thank you both. It's great to be here. Thank you. It was. Same here. And thanks to everybody at the